you'll please come in and be seated. We're going to start in about a minute. The luncheon debate will start in about one minute. Testing. Please don't make me call out any names. Welcome everyone, and uh, welcome to the OK Corral. It's high noon on the first day of summer here at Stanford University. And to every one of you that's listening to us on Stanford uh, KZSU radio and live on YouTube, to the Stanford Silicon Valley Energy Summit 2019 Lunch and Debate, where we prove that arguing can be a team sport. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeff Byron, and I'll be your moderator today. And uh, my job is to make sure that our de uh, debaters adhere to the Oxford-style debate format and to ask the piercing questions. And as in the past, we're going to be polling you to determine whether or not uh, excuse me, to determine our winner before we get started, I'd like to ask you to all take out your smartphones. Oh, and if you would, yeah, there, uh, bring up the, um, this website, slido.com. For, for those of you listening in, it's slido.com. And you're looking for the event code debate2019. And please make sure you select polls. There's a tab for polls. Um, we're not going to be having a chance to take any audience questions during the debate. So I'd like to go ahead and open the poll. Patricia, that's your cue. Got it. And let's bring up that slide that shows um, uh, the question. Andrew, can you help me out? It's up. Okay, I don't see it on this screen. Thank you very much. So if you would, please, this is just a test uh, to see if you all can follow instructions but also because we want your vote. It's really important to us. Uh, 
uh, you can change your answer until we close the poll. Just enter it and submit, uh, submit your, your, your uh, response. But only your last vote will count, okay? Uh, if you're having a problem, ask your neighbor. Uh, I'm going to leave this open for a little bit as I describe the format and introduce the debate topic. In previous years, we've debated such topics as, um, well, we've had, we've had, it's really been one of the highlights of the session, and we've had some incredible panelists, and a really informed audience is what makes this interesting. Uh, we've had a lively debate in the past uh, on uh, the adoption of electric vehicles, the future of nuclear power, the benefits and risks of hydraulic fracturing for oil and gas recovery, and the impact of autonomous vehicles. We've had some Nobel Prize winners, elected officials, and all have been experts in their fields. And I encourage you to please read the bios of the four debaters we have today. They're just extraordinary and distinguished individuals. Uh, today's topic will be one that has spawned a lot of interest and controversy. I suspect that most everyone in this room has an opinion, but do you really know much about it? Our debaters will not only try to persuade you to their side, but I also hope you'll find that they inform you along the way. And the topic is a timely one. Many of you may not know that just last month we celebrated the sesquicentennial, I love that word, the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Well, that's where this picture was taken, at Promontory Summit, Utah, on May 10th, 1869, where Leland Stanford ceremoniously drove the golden spike that joined the rails, providing the fastest route across the continent. May he rest in peace. The robber baron that he was made a fortune but he, and he exploited a lot of workers along the way. Uh, but you might say that's why this university is here today. We're here today, 150 years later, to debate whether or not California should continue to build its proposed high-speed rail system. Now, how many of you have been at previous debates? So we have a lot of new folks as well. That's wonderful. Unfortunately, due to the format and time constraints, I'm not going to have any chance to take any questions uh, from the audience, but we do need your vote. Hi, Gary. Um, so let's close the voting and, um, on our test question, and let's see the results. I have to turn to look. Oh, excellent, excellent. So we have a very patriotic and savvy audience here today. I can see that off the bat. Um, and we all hope that uh, the Stanford women will, will repeat as the U.S. women's team champion. So let's get to the debate topic. Our debate panel will be trying to persuade you to change your mind onto the, on, their, on the proposition. And I'm briefly going to describe the high-speed rail system in just two slides. And I'm going to ask you to vote on your initial position. Then following the debate, we'll pull you again to see if you've changed your mind. The winner will be the team that's persuaded the greatest number of you to change to their position. So keep your voting screen handy for the initial poll question, but before I have you vote, allow me to provide you with a little background. I'm losing my place here, there we go. The high-speed rail project is a publicly funded electric train that's being built in two phases. Phase one will enable passengers to travel between San Francisco and Los Angeles at speeds of over 200 miles per hour in less than three hours by the year 2033. Phase two will extend the system to Sacramento and through the Inland Empire to San Diego, and when completed will include 24 stations. And as what often seems to be the case for these large projects, the estimated costs have soared since the initial estimates were made. The latest estimate for completion of phase one is between 63 and 98 billion dollars. The cost for phase two has yet to be determined, 
and construction is underway. However, there is some uncertainty about whether the project will be completed. This is an important and timely topic to all of us here in California. Should the project continue? Is it worth the investment? Will we, will we realize the projected benefits and how long will it take? Let's go ahead and activate the poll question two and put that up again and you'll all see there. It's ready. I'm, I'm ready for you. It's time for you to vote. The resolution for today's debate is resolved. Should California continue to build its proposed high-speed rail system? Many of you have already formed an opinion. This group will try and change your mind, or at least not to lose your support. However, you can also be undecided to start with, and perhaps that will win. they will win over your undecided vote. The winners are those who change the most votes to their side. Please continue to vote on the resolution while I introduce our panelists. Gentlemen, would you please come up to the stage? I'm going to ask if, uh, that's so kind, go right ahead. Pro one, pro two, okay. con one, con two. That way the microphones will, he'll understand. They are trying to con people. <laughs> There's a little competitiveness in this group. <laughs> Lenny Mendoncha is the chair of the High Speed Rail Authority and director of Governor Newsom's Office of Business and Economic Development, um, and he is to my immediate left. Dan Richard, former chair of the High Speed Rail Authority, uh, is next to him. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. These are the protagonists. Oh, good. The antagonists are Dan Schneer, uh, adjunct professor, USC's Annenberg School of Communications, UC Berkeley Institute of Government Studies. I'm sorry, I introduced him out of order. That's, that's Mr. Schneer at the end. And Steve Wesley, founder and managing director of the Wesley Group and the former controller of the state of California. Gentlemen, thank you all for being here. So panelists, here's the format for our Oxford-style debate. We're going to hear an opening statement for speaker one for the motion, and then an opening statement by speaker one against the motion. You will each have three minutes. Followed by an opening statement by speakers two and four, the motion, and speaker two against the motion, also three minutes. I will then pose the questions to each of you, the, po the, the piercing questions. You take it wherever you want. The closing statements of each speaker uh, will be in the same order. However, it'll be two minutes each. And then we're gonna conclude with a second vote of the resolution to see who won the debate. But first, we need to see where the audience stands on the resolution. Let's see how you voted. Will you close the poll and show the results? Now, I, I can't see them except to look. Uh -oh. All right, so it looks like the vast majority, if I'm reading that correctly, we are, are for the proposition. <laughs> about 55%, and we still have about how many percent undecided? 25 undecided. Um, so, <clears throat> you know what you're up against, you know where you stand. Uh, it would seem to me that it's that, that it's, it looks as if it's the pros team to lose here. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. <laughs> Remember, it's the votes that change that count, okay? So Andrew, would you put uh, slide seven back up for us? I haven't gotten to slide seven. Uh, there's for the resolution and against the resolution. Should California continue to build its proposed high-speed rail system? We'll go ahead and leave that one up. Um, Let's see, let puts three minutes on the clock. We've got that uh, timer ready, debaters ready. Remember, I will ask you to suspend if you succeed your time. Let's, he let's hear from our first debate. Okay, excellent, ready to go. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for the overview of the project. It's great to be here at this Robert Barron University on the first day of summer and talk about the next generation of California's innovation. 
California has long been a leader in innovation, bold action, and tackling projects that everyone else thought was impossible, whether it's the California waterways, the state highway system, the master plan of California, BART, even the Golden Gate Bridge in the middle of the Great Depression. People said it couldn't be done, yet California persevered and built projects that are prime examples of the benefits that we see through when we think boldly and have a vision about what's possible. I have been following the high-speed rail project at a high level for years, yeah. with my following in my footsteps of my friend Dan to my left here. But when I became chairman of the board of directors, it really struck me about how acutely aware the benefits of high-speed rail are for the state of California. It holds fundamental economic and environmental promise for the hardworking men and women of California. The Central Valley, where 119 miles are under active construction today, is an area rich with roots and history. I grew up in Turlock, California in a dairy farm, and I contest to the importance and economic benefit that high-speed rail can bring to the center part of the state, a part of the state that is often overlooked, flown over, driven through, or frankly, just ignored. To those that say that this project is something that is not important to California and doesn't matter to those of us who grew up in the center part of the state is frankly insulting. Ensuring that we all are connected is essential to the California dream. It has been and always will be. The authority has been in construction since 2015, putting more than 2,600 men and women to work building that first stage of rail. Bridges, viaducts, grade separations, and other civic works are underway today. When voters approved Prop 1A in 2008, they asked that we commence this construction, and we are. In a state of California that's the size of California, high-speed rail service will have huge impact. Travel times between the Bay Area and Los Angeles Basin will be reduced from 12 hours by conventional rail or seven to eight hours by car on a good day to less than three hours by high-speed rail. The service promises to link California's major economic and population centers to the cities of, of Central California to the coastal Northern and Southern California. Already today, Substantial effort is underway, and substantial job creation is being evidenced where the construction is underway in the Central Valley. Fully 14% of the job growth in the Central Valley since construction event has started are attributable to the high-speed rail, and more than 50% of the job growth in Fresno County is because of the construction at this early part. I urge you to continue to support your wisdom in saying this is a great project. Thank you. Two seconds. That was pretty good. It's all right. Clapping is good. All right. I think uh, the first for the, for the opposition. And that would be Mr. Wesley. Thank you, Jeff. Let's be honest. We'd all love to have high-speed rail in California. In 2008, the legislature put Prop 1 on the ballot promising five things. First, high-speed rail would only cost $45 billion to build. It'd be up and running by 2020, that's in six months, providing hourly service between San Francisco and LA. It'd be faster and cheaper than the airlines. It'd make a profit its first year of operation. It would have 39 million passengers per year by completion. I'd take that deal in a minute. And so would most of you. Not surprisingly, so did the voters. Unfortunately, it's not real. None of those things happened. And that's the problem with high-speed rail. It costs too much, and it doesn't live up to the hype. So here are the four problems with high-speed rail. First, it costs too much to build. In the 1990s, proponents projected it would cost $33 billion. In 2008, they said it would be $45 billion. Today, projecting $66 billion. Do you see a pattern? I think it's going to cost well over $100 billion, and that won't be completed for a decade, if not two. Second it would cost too much to operate. The proponents say it's going to be profitable in the first year. But of the 1,800 public transit systems in the United States, only 2% are profitable. And those are the ones in the densest population areas. Simply put, California doesn't have the population density to make statewide high-speed rail profitable. High-speed rail not only costs too much up front, but it will likely leave the state with ongoing operating expenses for decades. Third, it's the wrong technology. There's a revolution occurring right now in autonomous vehicles, platooning vehicles, new Hyperloop technology. To commit ourselves now to invest $100 billion in what is essentially the same 
high-speed train technology the Japanese pioneered 60 years ago is short-sighted. Fourth, high-speed rail crowds out spending for other more important priorities. Is it worth taking $100 billion away? Public education, low-income housing, health care? I don't think so. If we were going to spend $100 billion on any sort of transportation project, which we shouldn't, wouldn't it be smarter to solve inner city congestion where the majority of Californians spend their lives stuck in gridlock? Let me close with a quote from none other than Governor Newsom. The project, and I quote, is currently planned would cost too much and take too long. There's been too little oversight, not enough transparency. Right now, there simply isn't a path to get from Sacramento to San Diego, let alone from San Francisco to LA. I wish there were. I hope you'll vote no on this initiative. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wesley. For the, for the proposition, Mr. Richard. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> first, I think we ought to change the rules. If the two guys who successfully ran this thing can't at least maintain the 55%, I think we win. So that, that should be <clears throat> the way it should go. Always changing the rules, Dan. <clears throat> you know, um, in 2008, uh, the voters did approve Prop 1A. And oftentimes people ask the question, as is being asked today, why should we build a high-speed rail or should we build high-speed rail? But really, I submit, with all due respect to the question today, it's the wrong starting point. The right starting point is to ask what kind of future we're going to have in this state. And keep in mind that we continue to grow. Even as the growth rate has slowed a little bit, we're on our way to 50 million people. In essence, the population of the state of New York is going to pick up and move to California over the next three to four decades. Now, our job is to make sure it's not actual New Yorkers, but I mean, that's the challenge <laughs> that we're dealing with here. So um, how do you accommodate that kind of growth and also maintain, not only maintain the, the lifestyle that we have now, but to have a sustainable future? This is an energy conference. Just about everybody in this room realizes that for the state to meet its climate goals, we can no longer just look to the electricity sector because we've cleaned that up. Almost 50% of our carbon emissions are coming from where? Transportation. The future of California has to be about electrification of the transportation system. And while my friend Steve Wesley might want to sit in an autonomous vehicle for seven hours from LA to San Francisco, I suspect most of you wouldn't. And a high-speed train is not only a conveyance for that, but in fact, if you look at the way the program is being delivered in California today, it is part of a broader statewide rail modernization that is investing in BART, investing in uh, Caltrain, investing in similar systems in Southern California. High-speed rail is the backbone of a broader rail modernization uh, program where the state's rail plan anticipates that 40% of all trips by 2040 should happen on some form of rail. Oh, it costs more than people thought it would. Yes, that's true. But here's the thing that people forget. If you don't build a modern rail system, what you're going to be looking at is a future that has 4,300 lane miles of additional freeways, five new airport runway complexes, 115 airport gates, at a cost estimated and confirmed by the GAO of somewhere between 140 and 170 billion dollars. So this is the most cost effective, most environmental, environmentally sustainable and intelligent thing that we can be doing. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Richard. And for the opposition, Mr. Schneer. I, too, would like a high-speed rail system that would whisk me from the Bay Area to Los Angeles in less than three hours. I would also like to start at center for the Golden State Warriors next season. <laughs> but let's agree that neither one of those things is going to happen 
Our debate today should not be about what we want and what we wish for, but rather what we can actually achieve. What Dan and Lenny are talking about, if you listen carefully, is a train that goes from Bakersfield to Merced. That's all Governor Newsom has signed off on. The rest is still just expensive daydreaming. But how much better, how much better to redirect all this time and money and effort into electronic regional transit systems that can improve and enhance urban suburban commuting within our largest metropolitan areas. Ask yourself two questions. First, how often do I need to get from here to San Francisco or San Jose? Second question, how often do I get to Bakersfield or Merced? <laughs> Unless your answer is the latter, then consider that spending all those taxpayer dollars on a better, faster, cleaner, and more convenient regional system might make a little bit more sense. Now, there are three main arguments for high-speed rail. Let's talk about each quickly. One, faster travel times. Yes, between Bakersfield and Merced. But for the Bay Area, for Southern California, for Sacramento, nothing is going to change. As we've just determined, there's a much greater unmet need for increased transit within metropolitan areas than creating a need in between them. Second, job creation. A regional transit system or a series of regional transit systems would create at least as many jobs in the state's largest markets than in the more sparsely populated Central Valley and almost certainly more economic growth given access to much lighter, larger rider pools that exist in the Bay Area and in Southern California. And third, environmental protection. I'll refer you to a University of California Berkeley study. I can cite that here today, Jeff, that's okay? Sure. A University of California <laughs> study in 2010, which estimated the construction, just construction, of the entire high-speed rail project would generate 9.7 million metric tons of carbon dioxide and would therefore take a carbon-neutral high-speed rail 71 years to offset its own construction-related greenhouse gas emissions. At that point, I will be 138 years old. I don't know where I'll be then or what I'll be doing, but I'm confident that one of my top priorities will not be on how to get from Bakersfield to Merced. So I'll conclude with one traffic to my friends Dan and Lenny. One question. Tell us how a train somewhere in the Central Valley is going to improve our commute from Palo Alto to San Francisco. Or is it really just a great white rail? Back to you, Ahab. Thank you. Oh. All right. Please. All right, gentlemen. Well done. The gauntlet's been thrown. Uh, so uh, we have about 25 or 30 minutes. Let's see if we can get into some of these issues. Let me turn to the pros first. And of course, my job is to try and make sure each of you gets a chance to respond somewhat equally, if not fairly. Um, and, and if any of you go a little bit too long, I will let you know. But you know, the price tag of this project is just soaring, as the opposition has pointed out. Now, now estimates are at as much as $98 billion, which has more than doubled since cost, uh, uh, since the since construction began, and, and, uh, and where will we be when this is, is completed is, is the question the opposition a, um, asks. At what point does the project cost become unacceptable? You want to start? Well, I think that in any economic sense, it becomes unacceptable when it becomes higher than the alternative costs. And the problem is that the things that we would have to do to maintain the same level of, um, of transportation efficiency cost two to three times as much. Um, there are also ways to bring down the cost. One of the things that I think is really important to understand if you're asking the overall question of should we have a, a project like this is that we've made amazing progress with this program under the worst possible funding circumstances. You shouldn't build something like this in dribs and drabs and pieces. And if there were a more sustainable funding source, the cost would definitely come down. Having to do pay as you go is one of the things that stretches out the time and increases the cost. So I guess I would, I would urge you to try to separate some of the cost expansion questions from the question of the overall benefit of the program. 
because my hope is that by the time the next administration comes along, we may have some more permanent funding mechanisms that allow us to do things like financing and, and so forth to, uh, to do that. Can I just say one quick thing to my friend Dan Schnur? I served for 12 years on the BART board. You want to know what the first BART line was? Concord to Pleasant Hill. Everybody here like BART? You always start with some piece somewhere, and basically it probably could be accused of being a train to nowhere. So whether it's in the Central Valley now or not, that is not the high-speed rail program we're talking about. It's a sequencing question. Uh, Steve, I know Steve wants to talk to the finances, but if I can just answer my, my I think friend. You should. I think you should. Sequencing implies a second sequence. When Governor Newsom gave his State of the State address this year, February 12, 2019, paragraphs 41 through 43, he said we could not afford to do a Los Angeles to San Francisco rail, and therefore Bakersfield to uh, Merced was the length of what he was willing to commit to. I'm all for sequential building, as long as you build on that first sequence. So. All right, thank you. Going back to the point, let's hear from the opposition on, on, the, on, the, on the arguments you heard. Two points on the financial part. Folks, I used to be the chief financial officer for the state of California. We don't have money for this. Let me be clear, $210 billion budget, that's a lot. What people forget is 70% is already spoken for every year between K through 12 education, the UCs, the CSUs, and healthcare. It's not There's a small piece of the pie that is left. And if you spent five or 10 billion a year on this, for the next two decades, you crowd a lot of that out. That is the fundamental uh, problem here. Dan also said, and we funded this under the most difficult circumstances. Folks, if you follow the market, last nine years, up and to the right, this is as good as it gets. If we go into a recession, it's gonna be about how much we're we cutting schools, how much do we cut our health care. This project will be an asterisk. Last point, and I have to respond to it. Dan said, maybe Wesley would sit in an autonomous vehicle for eight hours. I run a venture firm. We invest in mobility for the future. If you try to develop transportation systems looking in the rear view mirror, you'll get to the wrong place. There will be autonomous vehicles in the very near future, and they won't take eight hours to get to Southern California. They're likely to take four or five because of platooning uh, technology. It changes things radically, and you don't have to subscribe to the old world view that transportation from one end of the state requires being on old train tracks. We can do better, and I think it's California entrepreneurs from this valley that are going to create that new future. Let's not build a costly dinosaur in the meantime. Mr. Mendoza. Um, <clears throat> So a, a couple of things. First of all, I 100% agree with my friend Dan Schnur. There is zero chance that he will be playing for the Golden State Warriors. It's just not <laughs> Even with Clay out? Even without Kevin Even with Curry. Clay. <laughs> you're, you're not tall enough and your jump shot's horrible, Dan. I'm sorry. Um, I also, I have a deep appreciation for my friend Steve Wesley's investing experience. In fact, in full disclosure, I'm an investor in his fund. And I think it's a terrific opportunity to invest in alternative mobility solutions. We need all of the above. It's a false trade-off. It's like saying we don't need to invest in the next generation of mobile infrastructure. We don't need the internet. Just do these things on the edge, and that's all fine. This is a core infrastructure that can enable mobility to happen in a way that is an extremely efficient investment. And I'd also quarrel with my friend Steve, who is a, a, understands math and understands balance sheets versus income statements. It's not appropriate to compare infrastructure investments, which are capital expenditure, none of which are funded through the general fund, to an expenditure that is an investment for the longer term. It's funded through a combination of bond funds, federal grants, and cap and trade funding. And as my friend Dan said, when we have an administration who understands the importance of infrastructure, and by administration we're talking about Washington, D.C., California administration understands the importance of investing in infrastructure. We will have a federal partner who has, as the federal partner has in the past, viewed infrastructure investment and collaborating with the state of California as something that's a great thing to do. And the next stage of investment in high-speed rail that will complete the entire infrastructure will have to include 
ongoing state investment. It will include local investment, as local voters have shown many times their enthusiasm in investing locally, both in the Bay Area and in Southern California. And it will need to include private investment. All of that will come when we demonstrate and make possible a vision that we can start by doing places where we can build and demonstrate the pace and scale of that in the Central Valley of California. And for those of us who say it's a bridge to nowhere, I just find that a train to nowhere in the Central Valley, I find that insulting to the people where all of the growth and the future of California is in the center part of the state to say, it's all fine, we'll just invest in the Bay Area and Southern California, and that part of the states that could be the poorest state in the country for an independent state, it doesn't matter. That's insulting. I know we'd like to continue on this subject. I'm going to try and move us to another. Maybe we'll get to about four of them as we go here. Uh, you know, historically, I'm going to turn to the cons here. Excuse me. The opposition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you had it right the first time. <laughs> historically, gentlemen, big projects have produced big benefits, oftentimes much bigger than we ever thought they would. I'm thinking about the, United, the, the electric grid throughout this country. Uh, that really boosted this economy and has for over 100 years. The interstate freeway system, you know, the rail freight system, interstate pipelines. In California, we've got the water system that this state wouldn't be what it is today if we hadn't have made those early investments. And, of course, the education system at, um, what are those other schools? <laughs> yes, the UC schools. Tremendous education system. And. This has really enabled California's sustained population and economic growth, yet every one of these mega projects has had its detractors, its naysayers like yourselves. Um, aren't you going to regret arguing against this high-speed rail project sometime in the future, gentlemen? Maybe, maybe, I mean, you have said you're in favor, but is it just the cost or is there more to it? So let me take the, the first crack at this. First, Again, I've been the chief financial officer of the state of California. Every project you see, it's likened to either the Louisiana Purchase or the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, they don't all work like that, folks. <laughs> trust me. Uh, the question is, is this uh, the Golden Gate Bridge or the Hindenburg? You know, the wrong technology at the wrong time. <laughs> I would just say, and, and Jeff, you asked the question, uh, and it is, it is extraordinarily expensive. I ran through the numbers. This would crowd out a certain um, good-sized portion of the budget. We're about to go into a recession. That's going to make it doubly hard. The question really is, because I'm all in favor of smart infrastructure for the future, is this the plan we should be building for the future? And I think what Dan said is correct. You start out solving the problem in the inner cities where most of the traffic is now. And when you think about the end-to-end -end solutions, do we want to look at a faster train or should we be looking at something different? I am here to tell you there's a revolution in new technologies. We would be far smarter with better results, lower investment, looking at things like the Hyperloop, autonomous vehicles, platooning of vehicles and trucks. It is all going to change. Going back to trains in the 1960s is not the solution for California. Gentlemen, for the proposition, you can handle that one. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, although my friend Steve Wesley is a brilliant investor in technology, I spent five years at NASA as a kid, so I'm not taking a back seat on the technology question, and I want to address that right now. Um, I'll ignore Hyperloop, which is more hype than loop, but um, <laughs> I, I think... I think The Onion had it right when they said Elon Musk proposes a system that will be powered by the screams of its passengers. <laughs> when grandma can pull three Gs, we'll have Hyperloop. So, um, but, but let's talk about technology for a second. Um, first of all, you know, the Chinese aren't exactly taking a back seat to the rest of the world in terms of technology. What are the Chinese investing in? 25,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. They have a high-speed rail line that runs the equivalent distance of Seattle to San Diego. So they're certainly putting down a marker on that. Secondly, I get tired of hearing this argument about how this is old technology. This is old technology in the way that a Tesla is old technology. A Tesla has four rubber tires, runs on fixed guideways. And you say, no, no, that's crazy. A Tesla's not like a 57 Chevy. A Tesla has an aerodynamic design. It's got an advanced electric propulsion system. It's computer controlled. The first bullet train, the Shinkansen in Japan in 1964, went 135 miles an hour. 
The sixth generation Japanese trains go 235 miles an hour. How are they different from an Amtrak train? Oh, they have an aerodynamic design, they have a modern electric propulsion system, and they have computer controls. This is a highly advanced technology that many countries around the world are staking their futures on. And I give nothing to the argument that somehow this is an old school technology. This is a, a high tech and advancing、uh, program. And so I just want to dispense with that argument. Short retort. I, th I think before we compare the Chinese high speed rail system to the one we're talking about here, First, we should compare two countries' forms of government. And I would agree that with a totalitarian, authoritarian dictatorship, we could displace all those central, central Valley retailers and farmers and small business people with no problem whatsoever. But the tens of millions of dollars of unanticipated costs, of lawsuits, of economic displacement, of right away disputes are one of the many, many things that has moved us from the kind of high speed rail that Steve talked about a little bit earlier to the morass we're in now. What I'd say to you, Jeff, just quickly, is I think you framed with all due respect. By the way, have you noticed that the phrase, my friend, leads to a very unfriendly response. <laughs> Just like the phrase, with all due respect, means that there is no respect, no respect to follow anywhere. <laughs> Only for all, the argument. With all due respect, Jeff, I think you got the question wrong. It's not about thinking big and wanting to accomplish extraordinary transformational things. It's about which extraordinary transformational things do you accomplish. And what Steve and I are both saying is we all want to revolutionize, revolutionize transportation in California. We think the smartest, most impactful way to do it for all of you is to do it within the state's major metropolitan areas rather than duplicating what Southwest Airlines is already doing to move us from Burbank to San Jose and back. Thank you. I'd like to try another question, and I'll, and I'll turn to Mr. Mendoncha on this one. Uh, the argument was made by the opposition. The project,、um, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. With a, with a recent change in governors, support in Sacramento seems to have gone from vigorous to somewhat ambiguous at best.、Uh, like any major project that takes decades to complete, won't the lack of an executive champion doom this project? I think that's a complete misread of what the governor said and what we have been saying consistently. The governor wholeheartedly supports high speed rail. And he wants to do it in a way that our, our, my friends Dan and Steve would support, which is fiscally responsibly and in building blocks. We can't spend ahead of the money that we have. So we are building in a place where we have right of way and we can demonstrate that, which is in the important part of the Central Valley. While we are doing the environmental clearance on both ends in the Bay Area and in Southern California. So when then that's in place, then the next level of resource can be raised. Both locally, at the state level, federally, and the private sector to build out and connect those regions. So the governor has said wholeheartedly he is completely behind this and he wants to do it in a way that's responsible, transparent, and accountable, which is what we were doing. Hey,、Opposition. he put Lenny in charge, so I mean, that tells you something. <laughs> there's a <laughs> bad judgment. There's an, old say, there's an old saying in politics a gaffe is when a politician accidentally says what he's really thinking. And what Gavin Newsom said in his first speech as governor this year was the following quote, Let's be real. The project is currently planned would cost too much and take too long. Which I admit that I interpreted to mean that the project would cost too much and take too long. <laughs> the governor then said, Right now, there simply isn't a path to get from Sacramento to San Diego, let alone from San Francisco to LA. Which again, I took to mean that there simply isn't a path to get from San Francisco to LA. And to their credit, smart people like Lenny Mendonca and Dan Richard, that's even better than friends, by the way, smart people <laughs> like Dan and Lenny grabbed the governor as he was coming off the stage after the State of the State address and said, You just, to horribly mix a transportation metaphor, threw high speed rail under the bus. <laughs> you need to clarify the next day. That Merced to Bakersfield is what we'll do over the next 18 years between now and 2030, and then someday, some way in the future, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo will complete the LA to San Francisco portion. All right, thank you. Mr. Wesley, I'm going to turn to you. Let's go, let's go with, a, with an argument that was put forward by the proponents. 
uh, the fact that the, the future growth regions of this state happen to be in the Central Valley and the Inland Empire, uh, which are without really any significant north-south transportation links. Are you going to ignore them? What alternative do you provide, what are you going to suggest as an alternative to high-speed rail? So tell me how you're addressing this issue. Look, two points. The Central Valley is incredibly important to the future of the state. I've spent a lot of time there. It is important. I used to serve on the board of UC Merced. We need to invest in the Central Valley. But that doesn't mean we need to run high-speed rail through the Central Valley in a costly transportation scheme. If you look at where is population going globally, it's going to the urban areas. That is just a fact. And so if you're thinking, where do we spend our limited transportation dollars, I agree strongly with Mr. Schnur, you spend them in the major urban areas of this state. One other point I just wanted to respond to, to uh, Dan's comment earlier saying, hey, the Chinese are, are no uh, pikers here. They're putting down a lot of electric rail. Dan Schnur is absolutely right. In a dictatorship, you can do whatever the heck you want. We have to assemble. We've already assembled 1,400 parcels to get this state to state. We still have 400 to go. There's no assurance we'll ever get those other 400 sure left. Well, Last point to Dan is, the Chinese are already moving to Maglev. This project is going to take at least 20 to 30 years. I grew up in Silicon Valley. I work with entrepreneurs, and I'm here to tell you, well before 20 to 30 years, we're going to be moving far beyond uh, the current uh, electric train transport of uh, 2019. And I'd hate to spend $100 billion on the wrong toy. Mr. Richards. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, a couple things. Um, first of all, on this question of should it be a statewide north-south thing versus regional, that is a legitimate public policy question. How's that? That's even better than smart. Right? <laughs> 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 it's a legitimate public policy question. I think that what we've shown, um, certainly when I was there, it's been continued uh, with my successor, is that it is a, a choice we don't have to make. We need to do both. And by the way, somebody mentioned airlines. You know who one of the biggest proponents of high-speed rail is? San Francisco Airport and LA World Airports. Why? Southwest doesn't want to fly you between Burbank and, uh, and Oakland. They want to fly you from Burbank to Baltimore. They want to go with a European model where these short haul trips of 600 miles are done by rail. That is where the rest of the world is going. That's where we should be going. But let's say something else about the growth in the urban areas, which, by the way, I agree with my friend Lenny that there's a lot of elitism here about leaving the Central Valley behind. I'm a Northern California guy, spent a lot of time down there, and, and, and I defended starting in the Central Valley. But forget that. Here in the Bay Area, Google is putting in a 25,000-person campus where? At the Diridon station, which is going to serve high-speed rail, Caltrain, and so forth. Where are those 25,000 people going to live? You can't get across San Jose in an hour and a half. It's an hour, it's a 52-minute trip from Madera to that point. So the opportunity to connect the Central Valley and the Silicon Valley, which is the fundamental bedrock of the first piece of high-speed rail, is going to be massively important to maintain the economic vitality of this region. That's one of the things that we need to do. Gentlemen, this is great, but we only have time to maybe sneak in one more topic. The, the proponents brought this up, and that is uh, this project is being put forward as a major contributor in meeting California's greenhouse gas reduction goals. So is it going to accomplish this, and to what extent? Let's start with the, with the pros. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, for, first of all, you need to rebut one thing. It has been the, the high-speed rail program is offsetting <clears throat> every uh, every pound of carbon dioxide emissions of the construction during construction. So it's not going to be a net negative. And it's two things that you get with this kind of a rail modernization program, because it's not just high-speed rail; it's high-speed rail and regional rail. That's what the state is pursuing here. You get the benefits of attacking the 50%, almost 50% of greenhouse gas emissions that are in the transportation sector. But you get something else too. With good land use, you get sustainable growth. We can't just take people to the Central Valley and have them go out and buy five acre ranchettes. What has to be, this has to be part and parcel of an overall 
strategic approach to the state's sustainable future that says that we can build communities that are sustainable and connect our mega regions with high speed rail and, and associated transportation systems. And Mary Nichols, the head of EPA, has said that is the reason that she supported the allocation of cap and trade dollars which are going to pay for high speed rail. And it's in ARB's strategic plan for carbon reductions that high speed rail is an essential piece of it. For the opposition. The fact that we are using our cap and trade revenues that are specifically earmarked for greenhouse gas emissions to build a train to me is a fundamental violation of the rights of every Californian who wants to create a better and safer and more environmentally conscious future for our children and our grandchildren. Cap and trade was passed with a very specific idea that would be used to impose financial burden on the state's biggest polluters to help save our environment. Last week uh, in California, uh, the governor and legislature decided to use some of that money in lieu of a state water tax under the tortured uh, re reasoning that people without clean water would have to drive to the store to get bottled water and that would increase our greenhouse gas emissions. This project is, once it's in place, if it's ever in place, is going to be carbon neutral. Until then, the studies show that it's going to take decades to offset the environmental costs of construction. Lastly, remember that this study was done in 2010. Since then, advances in alternative technology for electric vehicles and other more carbon efficient transportation have increased tremendously thanks to Tesla, thanks to Uber, thanks to Google, not so much thanks to government. Let's save our planet first, and then let's build a train. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, let me ask, is there, any, is there either side willing to concede any ground to the other? <laughs> I, I mean, except for the opposition saying that they're both in favor of high-speed rail at the beginning of the debate. We, we conceded that Dan is not going to play basketball. OK. There you go. All right. <laughs> now on to closing remarks, two minutes each. We're going to begin with the first proponent, and we're going to alternate as we did at the beginning. You feel free to stand if you wish. Two minutes. I, I will remain seated because there's no need to intimidate our opponents any more than we already have intellectuals. <laughs> um, I'd just like to conclude with, uh, with three thoughts. Number one, our, uh, our opponents and their con, they're definitely con, um, are trying to create a false trade-off. We need deep, more substantial investment in our urban corridors. We need more housing where the jobs are cre being created in, in this part of the state and in Southern California. We need more jobs created where people are coming from in the center part of the state. And we need an infrastructure that connects those. Those are not trade-offs. Those are simultaneous investments that Californians have been willing to make. They've made it through the passing of the proposition that put high-speed rail on the ballot. They made it and reaffirmed it in passing Prop 1A to reinvest in our local activity. They have done it in Southern California with tens of billions of dollars in investment in infrastructure in Los Angeles, and we're likely to have another measure on the ballot that will be a mega measure to support investment in the Bay Area. Those are false choices. Yes, and. We can do both. California needs local investment, and we need infrastructure that connects them. Secondly, I continue to be amused when people in Silicon Valley say, we don't really need to connect to the Central Valley. Have you driven over the Altamont lately in the morning? two or three hours of people sitting by themselves in a car, polluting the environment, ruining the, the, uh, the, their family lives, and creating an unsustainable environment where we've got people living in one place two hours away and sitting in a car to get to a job to earn slightly over minimum wage. That's not sustainable. What we need is a, a more visionary view about what California can be, where we have Silicon Valley, but the valley of Silicon Valley connected to Central Valley. And finally, I'd like to ask a question of the audience. How many of you have been on a high-speed rail in Japan, in China, in Spain, in France? That's great. I'm delighted. Why can't we have that in California? We look forward to it. Nice. Very nice. Very good. Mr. Wesley for the opposition. The other side's made a good case, and I want to thank them for it. But the fact remains, high-speed rail is too expensive, and it 
doesn't live up to the hype. Now, we've heard a number of things. We've heard the feds will come to the rescue and pay for it. I doubt it. I think Donald Trump is more likely to bail out North Korea than to help California with high-speed rail. <laughs> uh, we've heard that it will make a profit from year one. Uh, look, if 39 million passengers show up, it might. But what if it doesn't? What if we get half that many? Remember, 98% of the 800 public transit systems in the United States lose money. This system could be a drag on the budget for years, and that means crowding out things we care about. Third, is high-speed rail California's number one priority? If it's your number one, go with it. But do we really want to crowd out spending on homeless, public education, relief for student loans, for high-speed rail? And if we did spend that extra $100 billion, which we shouldn't, wouldn't you rather spend it on fixing congestion in the Bay Area and Los Angeles, where most of the people in state are moving, rather than Visalia, Bakersfield, or Modesto? Or would it be, be wise to wait for a new, better, and more cost-effective alternatives? Would you rather bet on Caltrans or Elon Musk to come up with the right system for the future? My biggest concern is what happens if we go into a recession. Caltrans. Like most economists, I believe the next six to 18 months, we're going into a recession. And the reality is, we have 231 billion in unfunded pension liabilities today that we're on the hook to pay. If we go into a recession, state revenues could easily shrink by a third. Who's going to pay to finish high-speed rail then? And I think one thing we can all agree on, I think the governor's right. The project is currently planned would cost too much and take too long. There simply isn't a path to get from Sacramento to San Diego, let alone from San Francisco to LA. I wish there were. Simply put, it's a matter of priorities. High-speed rail is too expensive and doesn't live up to the hype. Thank you. Mr. Richard, for the proposition. Before turning to my closing, I just want to say that Steve Wesley and I have known each other for 40 years, so we really are friends. Adjacent cribs. But, um, <laughs> but his last remarks reminded me of the immortal words of uh, Mayor Richard J. Daley from Chicago, that together we shall rise to higher and higher platitudes. <laughs> With all due respect. <laughs> my friend, Dan. Thank you. So... Um, there are two things I want to say in closing. First of all, we can, we can make the substantive arguments about high-speed rail. And by the way, one thing we didn't get to talk about is that around the world, in the 16 nations that have built high-speed rail, in every case, once the capital is expended, these systems generate positive cash flows. So this is not something that's going to tear into the general fund. And we've confirmed that again and again and again. Like BART. But I want to go, but it's not like BART because those are regional transportation systems that require subsidies. These compete against airlines, inner city. The economics are fundamentally different and that's documented uh, all over the place. But here's where I want to end up. Lenny Mendonca started out by citing some of the great things that California has achieved over the generations. The state water project, the master plan for the state university system, BART. You want to know what they all had in common? They passed by one vote. In 2012, we passed high-speed rail in the state senate by one vote. Anybody sorry that we built BART? Anybody sorry that we built the university system? These things were all controversial. And by the way, we also built the world's largest hydroelectric system, privately owned, the world's largest privately owned geothermal system. This is what we do in California. And I'll just end with this. On July 1st, 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Transcontinental Railroad Act. Now think about what happened then. The Union hadn't won a single major battle in the Civil War at that point. It was the darkest days in the history of the country, and yet, and yet, our government invested in two things. Transportation, and the other thing was the Land-Grant College Act. Transportation and education. Infrastructure physically and infrastructure for the mind. This is what we do in California. This is what we need to do. Thank you. And in closing, against the proposition, Mr. Schneer. Um, 
Before I get started, I have to acknowledge a weakness, not only in my own argument, but in this conversation. The four of us inadvertently, I think, have framed this as a battle between the Bay Area and Southern California on one hand and the Central Valley on the other. And that's not the case. Like Lenny, my friend, <laughs> I want to help the Central Valley's transportation needs too because it is the greatest potential engine of economic growth for California in the decades going forward. But let's take a look at it from a slightly different perspective. In the last two years, California has raised its gas tax by almost 20 cents a gallon. Californians now pay one dollar more for a gallon of gasoline than the national average. If you live in Los Angeles like I do, or in a heavily populated urban area like most of you, it might not be that much of a big of a deal. But for those residents of the Central Valley who will help lead California to its next period of economic growth, that's debilitating. There are $130 billion worth of unmet transportation needs in California. Those will not be filled for decades as long as we're spending $100 million plus on this train from Merced to Bakersfield. Five years ago, the USC LA Times poll asked Californians, do you want the chance to vote again on high-speed rail? And 70% of the respondents said, yes, they do. So let's imagine that ballot measure today based on what we know now versus what we knew in 2008. The initiative would read as follows. Quote, should we spend tens of millions of dollars of taxpayer money to build a train to run from Bakersfield to Merced that would take money away from greenhouse gas reduction projects and require taxpayer subsidies to remain solvent? Someday the train might be extended to run from LA to the Bay Area, but then again it might not. We really can't tell you, please vote yes. I voted for Proposition 1A in 2008. I'm not sure I'd vote for that initiative. I don't think you should either. Thank you very much. Very so hold your applause for, the, for these gentlemen. We're going to thank them momentarily. But right now, we need to know, have any minds been changed? Who won the vote? Let's, let's find out. Andrew, would you please bring up the, uh, the question? And I'd like you all to go ahead and, op if you would, open the, uh, the voting, Patricia. Please take out your devices again and, and vote. Read all the options to make sure you vote correctly. We're not voting another time. While the votes are being tallied, I have just a few logistical instructions for the next set of panels. They will begin shortly at 1.10, and I'm sorry that we've run over a couple of minutes here. I, I, I really feel terrible if I've uh, offended any of my fellow organizers. Um, the PG&E bankruptcy and managing renewables on the grid uh, panels just head that way. However, if you want to see a great panel on achieving corporate clean energy goals with a complete panel of women moderated by a woman, <laughs> stay right here. If you're, uh, that's Mariana Grossman's panel. If you're moving to another room, I'd ask that you please clean up, clean up a little bit. Remember to take your belongings. If you're not moving, you have a few minutes before the next panel begins. Keep voting. I'm going to be closing the voting momentarily. What's the number up on the right-hand corner? We're in good shape. On a personal note, I have to tell you I've been associated with the Silicon Valley Energy Summit since 2001, and I see some others here as well who have been involved for a long time. I'm thinking of my friend Joe Desmond, who I haven't seen for a while, and others. Um, I think this is very likely the best group of speakers and topics we've ever had. I can tell you that the organizing committee put a, a great deal of thought and effort into this year, and they've gotten some recognition. But I'd like to ask you in, in, to join me in thanking the real person and her team behind organizing this uh, event and making it so successful every year. She doesn't do it for the money. Uh, she does it for love. Jim Sweeney's wife, Susan Sweeney, if you'd please thank her. Susan, are you here? I asked her to be here. There she is. And of course, the countless, the countless people, volunteers, and others that, uh, that work on this, we appreciate it very much. So it's time. Panelists, you've done an incredible job. I, we, are so, we are so fortunate to have you here, win or lose, what do you say, audience? Please join me in thanking them for their expertise.
their humor, and for their efforts in being here today. All right, if you will, please close the polling, and let's look at the results. Oh, well, changed. One. It stayed the same. I All right, one by one. it would appear to me, it would appear. One vote. <laughs> I, I have, I'm, I'm challenged here. I guess I have a microphone. I got to read these. All right, unchanged, 61%. Changed two for the resolution, 18%. And changed to against the resolution, 17%. So it looks as though the, the pros have it by that much. Congratulations, gentlemen. <laughs> one vote change. Yeah. Was, no uh, change of mind. Was one. Was, that was great. Well done, Jim. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. You killed them. You killed them. You guys are wonderful, and we're still all friends, right? Absolutely. We're still hey, all friends. <laughs>